I'm Owen Fleetwood Jenkins and we're in West Wales, Pembrokeshire and this is Studios. So this is the dead room, the room without any parallel surfaces. We can close these doors to isolate from the larger room. And then this is the large room with a ceiling of about five and a half meters. And here lives the Persan Grand Piano and the Hammond C3, the Bechstein Model 4 uprights and all the guitar amps. It's a Bechstein Model C, I believe. It's from the 1920s. It's a semi-concert grand. I played a note on it in the shop and yeah, I couldn't stop. It's one of those sounds I just couldn't get out of my head. It's been fully refurbished. New action, new strings, new hammers, new dampeners. So this is the low C. It's not too soft and not too bright. Mm. Every manufacturer has their own sound. Like the Blutheners are darker and the Yamahas are brighter and the Sineways are just really powerful. Yeah. But I've, I've, I've always been drawn to Bach's sound for some reason. I've, I've always wanted to get a piano trio here, but they won't come unless they know the piano. Right. And it's too far to come and try the piano out before you book. Yeah. So there's been a lot of back and forwards with a few people and those bookings have never come through, unfortunately. Because I can tell them they'll love the piano, but I mean, that's like a salesman, isn't it? Well, when I bought the piano, I realized I need to get better mics because the piano is just better than the mics I had. It's, you know, they weren't capable of capturing just how good it was. So that was the main reason for buying this Hum Audio Devices. It's called an RS2. It's a stereo ribbon microphone with built-in mic preamps and like a Pultec airlift. It's built into the body of the mic and it's remotely controlled from the control room. And you can do blum line or you can twist this and it'll go into mid side and it decodes the mid side for you so it comes into comes into the console as a stereo file. They're all made in Poland. Mm -hmm. It's designed by a studio engineer in Poland, who I believe recorded a lot of piano and he didn't have the mic he needed to record piano with. So he he, oh, he designed this. Depends how close sounding you want your piano really. You can just move it in and out to find where it fits in the mix, really. And you can go, you know, over the hammers more if you if, if it's in a dense mix. Other mics I like on piano. I really love the coals on piano, to be honest. I know people love them on drums, but I think they're even better on piano. And again, the old four and fours I love on piano, just over the hammers more. Like a spaced pair like this. That always sounds great. They're not the brass capsule ones. But yeah. they're still really good microphones, I think. I love these on overheads and piano, really. Yeah, the reason I want a chapel to build a studio in is because they already sound great. I mean, this room is largely left how it was. Cause they were designed to project the minister's voice. Another thing I love about this room is it never gets too loud. Even if there's a drummer in here hitting hard, the cymbals never become unbearable. The sound doesn't carry away with itself. So this Bechstein Model 4 is made in 1900. 
This is unrestored, but very well looked after. So the hammers are a bit harder. And it's just got a great character. It's nowhere near a honky tonk. It's much nicer than that, but it's a real songwriter's piano. I, it's, it? I think it's a very easy piano to connect with. The action and pedal are really nice to use. And you, you get out what you put into it. With, with the grand, very powerful. Yes. It's very posh. And I, I feel like people are making less posh records at the moment. Hence why everyone's distorting everything. So here we've got this 1968 orange mat amp. Very early one, serial number 13. That's just been fully refurbished. And this is Laney LA30. There's a reissue of the super group. Yeah. Incredible amps, Laney. Old 60s Westminster, made by Watkins. Got a few old Wham amps. Early British, British amps, really. And this is a cool um, valve strobo tuner. It's got all the original valves and it works better than any tuner I have in the studio. You know, on a usual session, so the piano will, if we're using the piano, it'll be the other way round up against the back wall with the lid open. We often use this booth either as double bass or like a guide vocal or to isolate some amps. And then drums are in the dead room here with the doors open or closed, depending on what sound we're going for. So this is a Hammond C3 with a Leslie 122 and PR40 tone cabinet. I get a lot of bookings for this because this is the, well, one of the dream setups for Hammond players really. Doesn't get much better than that. The thing I like about this place is it's more than a studio, it's more People really get an experience when they come here and they don't want to leave and they feel like it's been a holiday. And the, the room sounds great. Um, yeah, it just means you can just crack on and make the record rather than try and find the sound for hours. Yeah. It, it's there and we can work with it. And moving, moving quickly in a session is really important for me. And I've set it up so we can move quickly and get good results. People come from all over the place to record here. They, all over the UK, further afield, uh, Norway, Europe, America. And w w once they're here, they're here for a week, two weeks, two months. And they really just lock down and get into the record. Yeah, I've, wanted, I've wanted a studio since I was about 14 years old, I think, and I went on work experience to a, a studio locally. And then I went to Birmingham Conservatoire to study more. And when I graduated, I mentally told myself, by the time I'm 30, I want basically this. And I bought this when I was 28. Here we are. It's a pinch yourself moment every time I walk in, really. I think it's a great, it's in a great size category of studio. Mm. Like you can get the smaller studio sound, which I really like. And you can get huge explosive drum sounds. Another thing I like about drums in here, I normally place the drums in the dead room and have the room mics out in the bigger room. It's a studio where the toms sound huge and the cymbals are very quiet. So when you're compressing room mics and bring things up, you're not bringing up problems. If anything, it, it, it lacks symbols, which is a rare thing, I think, in a room. Super dry. Yeah. It's bright. It's not, it's not a dull room. It's just dry. 90% of the time the drum kit will be just here. And then we can open, the, open and close the doors depending on how much room sound you want or spill on other instruments that might be recorded live. Other things we do here, acoustic guitars are great in this room. 
And also, if there's no drum kit, it's a great vocal booth, really, because it's, well, it's bigger than a booth, but it's dry as a booth. So in here, we've got the mic covered and cable covered. So everything's in easy reach, really, because it'll just look like a messy cupboard on camera, but <laughs> I know where everything is. I, I emptied it the other day to, to have a little spring clean and it filled this room. So in this cupboard, this is where all the vintage drums live in the studio. So this is my bigger kit, it's a Slingland Jean Cooper Deluxe outfit from 1958. 22 by 12, 13, 16. And then here we've got a 60s Rogers holiday. 22, two 12 inch toms and a 16 inch floor. And then the Slingland Jean Cooper jazz outfit from 1964, which is 20, 12, 14. Then we've got Ludwig's 402, 400, a 30 scratch broadcaster, a magnesium VK snare made in Sheffield. Yes, loud and bright and light. Yes. Then the Noble and Cooley Zilligen snare drum, which is made from basically melted down Zilligen cymbals. And then an Eddie Ryan snare, who was uh, one of the first custom drum builders in the UK. They were made as collector's items in 1989. There was a hundred made. And when they came out, they were the first drum that was priced at over a thousand pound. And they were almost 2000 pound new in 89. So all these drums are included in the day rate. There's no, there's no hidden extras anywhere. And they're all really well maintained and tuned, new heads. On most sessions, people come and use these drums. Sometimes they bring their own kit, sometimes we change kits from song to song, or they use bits of theirs and bits of here. But a lot of the time, these are the drums are used on the records here. Ooh. Could have been on you being frames. On every session, I will tune a drum kit before the band arrive in case, you know, they want to use it. Yeah. They don't, you know, they don't have to use my tuning or my drums, but I, I really enjoy tuning drums and getting the right sound at the source. So they, these are really handy. They're like tension tuners. You place them on the lug and it, so you can get equal tension on the drum. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it's equal tuning, but you can at least get a good starting point. So that's really handy in the studio. And I remember what settings on what drums and what skins gets me certain sounds. So at least it's a good starting point. So if someone says I want a dead 70 sound, I know what drum kit to go for, what skins, tension, and how to dampen it. If someone wants, you know, a big, more Bonham type sound, again, I know what kits to grab, what skins to choose and how to tune them. Yeah, All good? Watch your head. So this is the control room. The reason for having the console facing away from the players is it gives the players more privacy, really. I don't think it's... I've never enjoyed watching people perform when they're under pressure. Because of the nature of the building it was, I didn't want to get rid of the squarer shape. I know in the studio, you, you tend to think you should have non-parallel surfaces, etc. But I would, I felt like I would ruin the feel of the building up here if I was to do that. So I, I've tackled it with just some acoustic treatment, really. I'm really pleased with the sound of the room. This window here, this so us two double glazing windows on an angle together. So at least when the sound come out of the speakers, it will deflect it upwards instead of straight back. So there's subtle 
acoustic designs in here. The console, the centre of the control room, is this Kadak J-Type. It's got a range of channels, it's got the mono input channels, the dual input channels, there's some stereo channels, eight groups, and the first eight preamps have been modified to be transformer balanced by Chris Roberts, so they're Lundell transformers, where the J-Type is traditionally a transformerless console. This I would just describe as open, it, you know, in terms of high end and low end. I just feel like the octaves go down and down and down as well as up. It's not like mid boost or anything, or it's just pretty flat, but it just goes on. It's quite a big sound. I love antique shops. I think if I wasn't a studio engineer, I'd turn this place into an antique shop. I've got plenty of stock. We've got this stereo Hawk spring reverb. I think these were originally part of a hi-fi to add yes. vibe to your records. And this 60s Telefunken Echo Mixer. It's a spring reverb, mono spring reverb with geranium diodes. So if you drive it hard, it turns into like a fuzz reverb. Then your old Watkins copycat. And the Roland Chorus Echo. And in the back there's a Great British Spring Reverb. And again, more classic British amps really. And these are all plumbed into the wall, which feed cabs downstairs in the main live room. So this is the Audio Kitchen, The Big Trees. This is my, one of those game changer kind of bits of equipment that I didn't lend to anyone because I'll need it. So this is a, it's many things. It's a guitar amp, it's a valve guitar amp, and it can also be a valve overdrive pedal. And I've had it modded with this Sota transformer and a balanced output, so I can use it as a DI box as well. A DI box of dirt. And the EQ is great, the low end, oh, it's just so good, it never gets flabby. It just gets crunchy and Brilliant. So these outboard racks I bought in a local farm auction and they originally had two Vortexian 200 watt valve amps in them each. And amazingly they were perfectly 19 inches, but I think they're from early 1940s. So I've got the Dangerous D-Box as my monitor controller, Orion 32 for my I.O. Stereo 1073, uh, an AEA yeah. RPQ2, Distressor, and a Chiswick, a Chiswick Reach stereo compressor. So in the patch bay, so everything from downstairs comes into the patch bay, and then from there, wherever I want it to go, really. So the monitoring in this control room, are my main monitors are the Tannoy Arden HPD. They're from 1976, 15-inch dual concentric speakers and they're powered by a Quad 405 Mark II. And then I've got my Yamaha NS10s, powered by a big Yamaha P2 200. I love working on the, on the big speakers instead of midfields or near fields. I feel like they suit the room really well and they're really detailed in the higher mids and the low end. I, obviously you don't need a sub, I don't have to second guess the low end. When it's too much, I, I really know about it. And they really trans amazingly translate outside of the studio on smaller devices and in your car. What I love about this studio is, th this room in particular, it's light all day, and you experience the light going around the building. And it gets to like six o'clock and you still feel really energized and that you've only just begun. So welcome to the accommodation. So this is the accommodation with another piano and more Tano speakers and a record player. This is where we have breakfast in the morning and sit by the fire at night. Yes, cool sounding piano that one as well. Watch your head again.
So up here we've got the two bedrooms. We've got a little double room in here. So this is the double room. That's about it really. <laughs> yeah. So this is the bunk room. We can sleep up to six. It helps keep costs down because, you know, we spend most of the time in the studio, not in bed. So we can do quite large band sessions and sleep up to eight people here. There's other accommodation available down the road as an extra, but comfortably we can sleep eight here. So yeah, I love the social aspect of running a recording studio. The evening spent around the table and playing games and sharing records and great debates. It's, it's, it's my social life really. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Sorry. Right. Because we mentioned it downstairs, didn't we? This is a Premier 20 in 28 inch concert bass room. So Rogers Holiday 26 by 14, which is the kind of Rogers version of the Barnum Ludwigs. And then a Yamaha Recording Custom 24. Four by fourteen. It's the rock monster, basically. Oh, a bunch of guitars. A bunch of guitars, yeah. Those Telecasters. Some guitars built out of the wood from the chapel. So tell us about that. Go on, you go. You can't. So this is a guitar built from the wood. The from the pitch pine pews that were in the chapel. How's it sound? It sounds great. I've actually, I've got, a, this is one of about six. Um, a few of my friends have some, and there's a couple being worked on at the moment in the workshop. And they're from this part of the pew. They're from here down. And that's the perfect thickness for a Telecaster. It's gorgeous, isn't it? You wouldn't say it's 100 years old. So this is the Chandler Red microphone. So it's made by Chandler. It has the Abbey Road Red console preamps built into the body of the microphone. And you have the gain control on the back and it outputs a line level. So there's not that many around at the moment, but a very low noise floor. Again, it outputs a line level. It's a valve microphone. You use it mostly for vocals. But interestingly with this microphone, I feel like it works best if you're a foot and a half away to two foot and it sounds like you're there. It's a huge sound. Yeah, no noise. And again, you can go either into the console at line level or you can go straight into your converters or straight into a compressor. Kind of sounds finished when you record with it. So they're, I guess they're like transformerless U87s in a way. Yeah. It's the M7 capsule. So these moving acoustic screens are made by Audio Kinetics. And these originally came from Wessex Sound, which was a studio with some really big records made in. So I'm really lucky to have these here. And also I think Wessex Sound also had a, a Kadak at one point. Yes. That's a nice little link. Yes. 